<laughs> Welcome to the Weird Libertarians Daily Podcast. This is the 2020 Presidential Candidate Debate Series. I am joined by Dan Taxationist Beth Berman, Arvin, Vora, Christopher Marks, and Benjamin Letter. Guys, how are y'all doing today? Doing good. Good to hear. Yeah. All right. Pretty good. Great. Mm-hmm. All right. Welcome. This is part of a series of 10 debates with every candidate for president, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, formally invited to participate and provide their ideas on a variety of issues. We're going to be discussing science, energy, and education today. You'll have two minutes to answer these questions. At the end of your allotted time, I'll just simply say time, and you must quickly wrap up your thought. You can also finish and yield the remainder of your time. I will ask the question and call on you in a random order to answer. While I am a libertarian, I've designed these questions to be challenging and have modeled both the questions and the format after the major presidential debates, not the friendly formats that you may be used to. My audience is tasked with evaluating the quality of your responses. I will be judging you based on how prepared you are for the challenges that I propose, how well you understand the questions that I set before you, and how well you manage your time, and how compelling your answers are to all Americans, not just libertarians. At the end, we'll give you three minutes to issue a closing statement. And for today, since we only have four of the candidates join us, we're going to do a little bit of open forum after the questions, just for a little bit of time so we can shoot the breeze back and forth on this subject. Candidates, here we go. Climate change, according to most studies, is beginning to have a meaningful impact on the planet's population and is getting worse. Our biggest polluters are often restrained by government regulations. What is your plan to alleviate this problem? And we will start with Arvin. Uh, Hody, I'm going to have to disagree with part of that question because it is simply false that our biggest polluters are constrained by the government because our biggest polluters at this time, they, it is the government, it is the military, it is the biggest polluter on earth without any question. And unlike private industry where you get some pollution and you get something good, with the military, you're getting pollution and then something bad. We're creating enemies through that. So first, I'm going to have to disagree with that that position. Uh, Second, I want to point out that it is global warming that we're talking about, not America warming. And that means we need technologies that people will voluntarily adopt. They're not not technologies that we can force upon ourselves, a small fraction of the world's population, but will be entirely ignored by China and all of the other large countries in the world. The way to do that is through the free market. Take, for example, your cell phone. Your cell phone uses a low power screen. And I'll tell you this, if you told the Chinese they couldn't use a low power screen, they would be in rebellion. If you, if you said you have to use a high powered CRT screen from 20 years ago. Innovation works. And rather than giving green energy this kind of affirmative action that's gonna hold it back forever, we need to let green energy thrive and compete in the marketplace as it is successfully doing right now and allow it to take over worldwide so we can affect the world's environment, not just make an an impression of trying to do something without actually doing something. Great. Benjamin, that question goes to you. Um, Yeah, I kind of disagree with part of the question there, too. Um, I kind of think that uh, a lot of this climate change talk is is really just a a scam. A solar farm has never put a coal plant out of business, never replaced a coal coal plant. Um, Solar and wind is, you know, it's great technology, but it's, it's not, it it, it has yet to do that. It has yet to replace a a nuclear plant or a hydroelectric dam or a a coal plant or anything like that. it to this date, I think it's like 1% or less of the world's electricity is, is coming from this. And it's, it's rather deceptive because we often hear about the positives, but we never, we never hear about any negatives. It's like they're held to two, two different standards. Uh, in reality, from what I hear, nuclear energy is actually the, the safest, which comes as a surprise to me because we hear about incidents like Fukushima. but. Do you really hear about that many climate related deaths at all? I mean, are we hearing uh, on the news or anywhere? Is there a a crisis of climate related deaths? Um, Welcome to the. No, but 
uh, you really what this hear is, about is about, about uh, climate related deaths. Reducing fear, as in how like all the world's going to end in 12 years, hearing, uh, on you the don't news, hands or anywhere, you know, more of your money. Uh, Crisis so and climate related to subsidize our um, friends that are in the green energy business. That's what I think the scam is. Uh, I think we need to deregulate the energy market. I think that states and communities uh, should be free to, to make their decisions uh, without the uh, overlooming federal government uh, interfering. And I yield. Okay, great. Let's move over to Chris Marks. Hi. Christopher Marks of the, for 2020, uh, I am of the indigenous Miami nation. The treaties establishes a fiduciary duty for the United States to control, uh, to protect the object in exchange, the lands that are held in trust by the United States. Therefore, this is a federal issue. And yes, climate change is a real issue. Um, that's why part of my part of my overall campaign agenda is that of the U.S. A, a reforming our U.S. petrodollar into a new renewable resource electricity backed backed type of currency underneath Article One, Section Eight. Um, we can change the nation for the better and we can do this through the same thing that legislation has done through so many things legislation has established a social conditioning to actually cause things like um the feminist movement uh to establish those kinds of entitlements um has created the social welfare program that Yarvin so frequently speaks about we can, through legislation, conform our nation to become more, more eco-friendly. And that is what I plan on doing through the March 2020 administration. I yield my time. Great. Let's wrap it up with Daniel Taxationist Steph Berman. So if you remember the story of Chicken Little, we're literally be, being told that the sky is falling. Um, there's hysteria around this whole climate change. Yes, the climate is changing. Um, it's been doing that for thousands of years. Uh, we've been told it's an, it's an emergency and we're all going to die since, I don't know, since probably before the 60s. Um, we were told this, uh, you know, around 2000. We were told in the 90s and the 80s. We're always being told this. Now, pollution is a real problem and we should be working on cleaning that up however we can. But of course, taxation is theft. So whenever a government crony comes along and says, hey, we want to create a new tax that's going to solve some problem. That's a lie. Um, they want more money. They're probably going to subsidize more of the problem and create more of the problem. So as far as pollution goes, we can we can stop a lot of pollution by enforcing property rights. Um, if someone's polluting your land, if there's an oil spill, uh, put the liability on the company that's creating the pollution and make them clean it up. Um, there's also something else that um, you know, it, it, there was an idea um, when the United States was formed that it would be used to promote um, the development of science. Now, of course, how do you have a government program that, that develops science without taxes? Um, it's something that really doesn't need a whole lot of tax money. There are programs that the government's been involved in where they, they work with schools and they work with students and say, hey, develop something new. There's science fairs. There's world fairs. There's all these different programs that we have, and maybe we raise some money through some sort of lottery that instead of going to a winner, um, goes to whoever can develop some sort of new technology. It's a, we have some, some tournament prize thing. And this can be, um, it maybe it doesn't necessarily need to be operated entirely by the government, but it can be promoted by the government, and it doesn't require tax money to do it. We can raise all the money voluntarily, and this encourages people to find new technology to solve a lot of these problems. And I've seen so many, uh, there was a kid who, who built uh, this, this drone thing that swims around the ocean and collects up plastic. Um, there's so much innovation out there to solve a lot of these problems. And if we actually started looking at those, then we'd actually start fixing these problems instead of saying we need a new tax. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Wind, solar, ethanol, oil, nuclear, and more. The federal government has played musical chairs in subsidizing each one of these with little to no results. The public worries, though, that the economy will abandon long-term choices in exchange for short-term solutions for energy. What is your plan for energy, and how will you sell it to Congress and to the American people? We will start with Benjamin Letter. Uh, my plan for energy is simple, to, to deregulate. <clears throat> um, aside for, from 
you know, ma major issues of, for example, you know, you live downstream from this factory and they've clearly destroyed your stream of which I don't think that we need a dozen agencies to be in the middle of that. Uh, if somebody destroyed your stream, you can take them to civil court and you don't need all that. Um, so we, we, we have means of holding uh, big corporations uh, accountable, uh, you know, built, built into our system. Uh, we can we can deregulate. We can allow communities uh, to figure out their energy needs uh, themselves. What what works uh, in Arizona, you know, might not work in well in New Hampshire and, and vice versa. And, and and states and communities need the flexibility that they need to meet their energy needs. Great. Let's move on to Arvind Vora. Let's talk about what makes energy innovate. I don't agree with Dan. I don't, I don't think that you need to have a special separate system to lead to the innovate into the innovations that will yield more energy or yield more energy efficiency. I don't think we need a lottery system because the free market already rewards those. If you come up with a new low power, low, low energy usage system, you come with a new way to create energy, you're going to get rewarded by the free market. What we do need government for is for people who are too lazy to innovate. A classic example of this is what we see right now happening in the oil industry. The reason that oil companies are not investing in biodiesel research as much as they would be is because we have a military sitting in every country that has any kind of oil and guaranteeing them access to that oil. And what that is doing, it is removing the natural pressure to innovate. There's always a natural pressure, always a financial incentive to innovate and that's currently being artificially removed by the government. So my plan for energy is to just get the government out of it. You know, if somebody makes a more efficient solar cell, they don't need a prize. They've just made, they're going to make millions of dollars because they just made a more efficient solar cell. If somebody may find a more efficient way to do nuclear energy or a safer way, they don't need a prize. They're going to get that because you make a lot of money in the free market when you have something that improves something as fundamental as energy. This isn't something where the government needs to do anything. It just needs to stop protecting its cronies from the natural pressure to innovate. It needs to stop protecting its cronies from the startups and the innovators and the entrepreneurs. So how am I gonna make sure that we have better energy or make sure that we have enough energy? I'm gonna get the government out of it, make sure that the government is not there propping up incompetent companies and letting those companies compete with the innovative upstarts in the free market. Fantastic. Let's uh, move that along to Dan. Sure. So I guess uh, I'll respond to Arvin's uh, criticism of that idea. Um, I mean, you're right to, to a point that government doesn't need to do anything. Um, the reality is we have a lot of politicians who want to do something. And I think that uh, a system like this would in a way pacify these politicians by giving them something that they can say okay we participated in this but it's also nap compliant it's not creating a new tax it's not forcing anybody to comply with anything now of course you know this might as well be a nonprofit, uh a nonprofit program that has nothing to do with government but it's got something to do with the politicians and they want some credit on it fine um, I, I think there's there is some sensibility in doing something like that. But of course, you know, like you said, the free market also creates these other solutions. So maybe the free market would compete with this. Um, but we also have the idea that uh, kids and students who, who are in these programs, they're not so concerned about money. Sometimes they just see, oh, there's a big problem in the world and I want to solve it. I know when I was a kid, I had less interest in money and more interested in just solving the world's problems. So I think that's also something to take into consideration. All right, let's wrap it up with Christopher Marks. Well, you know, many of times I've actually spoken in regard to the renewable resource energy U.S. dollar system that I would like to com uh, com uh, change our nation away from this Federal Reserve dependency. Um, and this is what we can do. We can actually create this we can create it. And just as Dan had just expressed, our government is built up of attorneys and businessmen, and they want something to occupy themselves with. And, and, conform, and conform, conforming to the non-aggressive, non-aggression principle, we can give them a job. If you want to make, if you want to make money, 
than make money generating renewable resource electricity and pay for the government with that money. This will allow them to keep themselves busy and distracted so that allow the American people to live free from the tyranny that is our state government, stealing our property, our wages, violating our Fourth Amendment rights through taxation. I yield my time. Great, let's move on. Many of our greatest scientific achievements in the last century have been heavily subsidized. Even now, taxpayer-funded initiatives are the bulk of the source of income for scientific laboratories and research projects. What is your plan to make sure America continues to advance under your administration? Let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. Chris, let's start with you. Well, I don't think that we necessarily need to in a, create any in subsidies or incentivization in, to actually create ingenuity. There are plenty of there are plenty of ingenuity uh, innovation out there in the science technology market right now. One of the things that I'm the most heated uh, heated about is 3D printing technology. You can 3D print foods. Um, you can 3D print houses cheaper than you actually building a house. Um, you can 3D print a great many of things, and even our friends that are Second Amendment lovers and supporters have been 3D printing guns. Um, we need 3D printing technology to be in the front, and as we've seen in the 3D printing community, that uh, having that community working together together unhindered by governmental interferences allowed that in those innovations to swell and prosper into so many diverse things we can expect that same thing to come about from energy we just need to allow them to continue doing their achieve scientific achievements Dan i yield my time what do you think mm -hmm. dan let's go over to you so I, I think it's an interesting question. Um, you know, uh, subsidies are an incentive. So like uh, like we've kind of all agreed on that incentives are what create the innovation. Um, it's it's an incentive that's created through taxation, through theft. So you get rid of that incentive and other incentives will appear there. There are already other incentives. Um, there used to be a lot of private organizations that would um, that would pay for colleges for students to go to college uh, because just because they were smart, they seem to have high scores. Now, since so many banks are giving away so much money, that's a different incentive, an artificial incentive that was created by government. There aren't so many of those grants coming from corporations anymore because why would they pay for it if somebody else is? Um, the same thing is going to happen with uh, with innovation, with uh, with subsidies. If government takes away subsidies. Other people are going to say, well, hey, let's start putting money into into, um, you know, whatever kind of research groups, research firms, think tanks um, to develop these new technologies because they're going to be the ones to benefit from it. So I think, you know, the, you get rid of the government subsidies and the problem just kind of solves itself. OK, Mr. Vore, what do you think? I think we need to recognize that there are really two types of innovations that usually get conflated into a single thing. Oh, one type is R&D, you know, research and development, trying to improve a product. You know, every day you have some kind of an update on your app or operating system. Those are the, the things that are naturally very obviously driven by the free market, by free market incentives. Of course, a company is going to want to invest to make their product competitive, more competitive or more in demand. You know, whether that company has a lot of rivals like a tech startup or really doesn't have very many rivals at all, someone like Amazon, they, they still work to improve their products so that more people buy them. And that's already very obviously handled by the free market. But where people get worried is they want to know what happens to the pure research, the research that doesn't necessarily have a very immediate and obvious benefit to selling some kind of a product. And for that, we need to go back in history to a time before we had this system. Before we had this system where great researchers today need to beg from bureaucrats for grant money so they can do their research. What did we have before? I think one of the finest examples is the example of the Medici. The Medici were a deeply flawed and selfish uh, family, the, the subject of, of the book, The Prince. I mean, these weren't great people in the way that we understand great people, but yet, whether for vanity or curiosity or whatever, they managed to, to finance people like Galileo, Michelangelo. They, they made that research happen. 
And that research often went directly against authority. I mean, we know that both Galileo and Michelangelo had some difficulties with the authorities at the time. They were able to fund pure research, pure art, just for its own sake. Was it driven by their vanity? Maybe, but that's what free market, the free market does. It takes problematic incentives and spins them into beautiful research. On the other hand, the forced market takes good, in good motivations, like people in the military, and has them do something negative. Let's have the free market give us not just R&D, but those pure scientific innovations as well. All right, Benjamin, you got the closing words on this one. Well, I've never heard of a libertarian that was pro-subsidy. Maybe they're out there, you know, it's a big party. Um, and I, I have no intention of being the first. Uh, I think we get rid of the subsidies and the problem solves itself, just like Berman said. I think Arvin illustrated this, this same point a couple of weeks ago um, about how, I mean, look, look at today's social media market. I mean, we have people on, on YouTube uh, who are getting money from Patreon supporters for talking about video games. Um, so you can't convince me that uh, the, the private industries, uh, the corporations, Wall Street, um, you know, isn't interested in funding investment that could lead to return on investment. This is just a scam. This is one of those kind of government make work, uh, you know, government saying, hey, look, we serve a purpose. They do a lousy job of serving this purpose. Uh, so much so that it could be it could be eliminated, and I think that we would immediately see free market solutions. I think we'd see half a dozen websites pop up that specialized in funding all these various different uh, niches of, of of science and, and development. Um, it's it's pretty simple. I can't see why people would think that subsidies really in improving things just because. It's a claim. It's a false claim to fame. It's like the government saying, "Hey, if we send this guy, this guy's going somewhere. Here's some research and some technology that's going somewhere. If we send them a few bucks, we can claim credit for it." And that's all that they've done is just piggyback on the innovation of, of Americans uh, for the last hundred years. And I yield. Great. Next question. Careful with this one, candidates. On one hand, vaccinations have been shown to decrease and, el and eliminate the odds of getting some diseases that once threatened the entire planet. On the other hand, these vaccines, even when administered in the ideal time, are invasive and done before the child can knowingly consent and understand the risks. Do you side more with the parent's right to choose, choose or the child's right to choose for himself or herself, and why? We're going to start with you again, Christopher Marks. Hi, Christopher Marks, family rights activist. Um, I, underneath these circumstances, am in support of the parents' right to choose. I am adamantly opposed to the government's forced coercion into making the choice for the parents. Um, because, unfortunately, we do have a situation where legitimately children are parents' property until the child becomes of an adult legal age. It is the parents' responsibility to take care of their children and make those choices for them. Um, in regard to vaccination, I have been brought into a great many anti-vax conversations, and while I have my beliefs in support in some regard in, re in regards to vaccination. Um, we also have the problem of why is it that there is no doctor that's administering a vaccine that knows what is in fact in the vaccines. I understand protecting patents and intellectual property rights, but that's ridiculous. If you can't tell me what I'm going to be having, allowing a medical pr practitioner to inject into my child, um, you're not gonna get that to be able to inject into my child. Okay, that's great. Let's, uh, let's have you answer that question, Ben. Um, well, I guess this is how I would break down vaccines. Uh, I would side with the parents uh, over the government, and I would side with the child over the parents. Now, obviously, when a child's born, uh, they're going to have a really difficult time voicing much opinions in the matter, 
and the parents are going to either choose, you know, what what vaccine schedule they're going to go with or or not. Uh, and then, you know, once a child reaches a whatever age where that child is is protesting or you know or, you know attempting to refuse the vaccines, I think the child should have the right to personally refuse if capable of voicing that opinion. Um, I don't think that that we should uh, be you know implementing a, a mandatory vaccine schedule on society. Um, that's one of those things that you know uh, you better you better be real sure of yourself when you do that because there's there's no going back and and, and then are we really free at that point? I mean, isn't that what a rancher does to to the you know the herd of cattle? Just come in there and vaccinate them all up. No. Nobody gets a say. You don't have an opinion. Um, the the science is settled, and and you're just uh, you're just here um, and going to deal with it. I don't think that that's the country that we want to live into. I think it sets a dangerous precedent. Uh, what else are they going to be injecting into us uh, on a mandatory basis in the future? Um, yeah, I'm against mandatory vaccines. Okay, let's move on to our friend in the yellow hat, Mr. Dan Berman. So first, I want to say I disagree with the premise that uh, children are property. Um, property is, uh, if you have property, you can throw your property over the side of a boat. That's what you can do with property. You can't do that with a child. Um, you you are not the owner of a child. You are the guardian of a child. And so as the responsibility of a guardian, you're supposed to keep that person safe. This is a human being, not a piece of property. Um, all that said, the government comes along with sometimes with the good intent of saying we want all children to be safe so we are therefore going to man mandate these vaccines um i've talked with a lot of people regarding this vaccine issue um on both sides people who are pro-vax people who are anti-vax and the reality is that this is it's not a very polarized um topic even though that's how the discussion is being had some people are some people will say you need to get all of them. Some people will say you should get none of them. And neither neither of those are the right answer. Um, it does need to be case by case. You do need to understand what's in these vaccines and what they're used for and why you need them. Um, because you, you can't just say like, oh, well, this is going to cure some disease from the rest of the world if we can give this vaccine to everybody. Vaccines sometimes don't last. You can give a vaccine to a child and five, ten years later, they're not even immune to that disease anymore. Um, there, there are a lot of complications with this. There are, and not all vaccines are created equal. Some vaccines do have toxins in them. Others do not. Some are safer than others. Um, some, there's no risk for even getting the disease. So why would you even bother with the, even if it's a tiny, tiny, tiny risk uh, with the vaccine, why would you even bother with that if there's no risk of you ever actually contracting this disease? Or if it's a disease that's easily treatable if you do contract it. So these are all things that need to be taken into consideration. And it's not, it's, it's not black and white. And this is as if um, right now the government is actually preventing us from getting the right information on this because of the lobbyists and the way they're protecting these these organizations. But if we had the right information, we'd be able to make much more uh, safe and informed decisions. Two minutes on the button. Arvin, you get a chance to finish on this one. Either vaccines work or they don't. If they do work, then what business is it of yours if I choose to take not to choose not to take one? If they don't work, then why would I want to take one in the first place? Listen, I have taken many vaccines. I've taken vaccines as a child. I've taken vaccines as an adult voluntarily. I've taken vaccines that are recommended for everyone. I take, I've even taken vaccines that are not recommended and refuse to take other vaccines that are recommended. And that's my choice as an adult. The reason that I feel that I'm the person that should make, make those decisions for me is because no one on the entire face of this earth is going to care more about me than me. So I think I should be the one to make that decision. Now, when it comes to kids, we're in a complicated situation. Who should make the decision for the child? Well, I would say this, you should probably have the person who knows the most and cares the most about that child. And by and large, that's going to be in almost every situation, that child's parents. Not to say that there's not exceptions, not to say that, that the whole world is always one way, but by and large, a child's parents will care more for that child's well-being than anyone else. Dan is right. You have different circumstances. Let's say that I plan to raise a kid in a third world city. 
I'm probably going to want more vaccinations than if I decide to live, raise a kid in the middle of the woods, surrounded by 500 acres of land and no other human contact. Those are the types of things that make it logical for the person who actually knows the situation, who can think rationally, make those decisions. Uh, I, I agree. A child's not a property. Uh, it's not your property. It's somebody that you're taking care of. And because of just basic human and honestly, most of the animal kingdom instinct, you're going to want to protect that child. And so I don't think that having the state make that decision is at all right. I think it should always be the parent. Listen, there is no medicine on earth without any side effects and you need to weigh those things and the parent, not the government should make that decision. All right, right at two minutes again, candidates. I'm sorry about the death threats that you're going to get for talking about vaccines, but let's move on. There's a difficult balance between a company's right to protect its recipes and a consumer's right to know what's going into his or her bodies. Things like GMOs, gluten, and sugar substitutes are off and on required by law to disclose. How does your presidency aim to help protect the consumer and the businesses that feed them both at the same time? This time we were going to start with Dan Berman. So I think, um, you know, people get the information that they that they want to know. Um, we have this this idea that because government creates a law that says they have to put something on a label that otherwise it wouldn't be on the label. But the reality is people want to know what's on this and that creates the need for the label. The, the politicians might be the first ones to it. But, um, you know, if you consider that foods at one point had absolutely no labels with with no information on them, who came up with the idea to put those labels on there? Was it the politicians? Was it the food companies? Or was it the people who demanded to, to know that information? Um, the, the people would have put pressure on politicians or food companies to put that information there. Now, if you want that information on a label, you can refuse to buy, um, to buy products from anybody. You can have uh, third party organizations who can certify food as organic. Right now, food that's certified as organic is not necessarily organic. Uh, food that's certified as, as range-free chicken is not necessarily range-free um, because it's certified to government standards. But now if you have um, if you have a third-party organization and that organization is trusted more than government, as most organizations are, um, then you have you have a more realistic way to trust um, that, that that label is what it means. If one company is found to say, oh, we're certifying this as, as, as non-GMO because that's what people want, and they're found like, oh, they're just taking money to put that sticker on there. That sticker now means nothing and that company's going to go out of business. And now another company that has a higher standard of ethics is going to take over that business and they're going to be the ones certifying the food and you're going to be looking for a different logo. Um, this is all possible. This happens already with, with the consumer electronics industry um, where uh, there's, there's a UL company that certifies electronics as safe and stores won't even sell products that aren't UL listed because they know that there's a risk involved because those products might be dangerous. You might have the same thing with, and this is a completely voluntary system. This is not government mandated. So if you had the, if you apply the same thing to the food market, you'd probably start to see that happen with better results. All right, Mr. Vora. I have to agree with Dan on pretty much every point there. A few things I want to add. Today, many people don't want GMOs. The non-GMO project is not a government organization. It's not a perfect organization, is it? So that means there's room for comp comp competing firms, competing groups to put their own system in there, or maybe just to put pressure on the non-GMO project to become even better. Underwriter Laboratories, that's another perfect example that Dan, that Dan just brought up, which is an organization that is literally there certifying consumer electronics, and that stamp is required, as Dan pointed out, by many electronic stores because people want safe things. Now, suppose there was a company that just absolutely refused to say what was on its label. Then I would absolutely, uh, what was, in, what was in, in the product, and I would absolutely refuse to buy it because I know a lot of times people put junky stuff into foods. It's one of the reasons that many people, in fact, like to grow their own food. They want that level of control. The idea that if government wasn't there, people would stop caring for, their, for themselves. They would stop caring about their own well-being is absurd. The thing that people care about more than anything else in the whole world is themselves. And so we don't need to have this thing being done by the government that is literally going to be done anyway, no matter what. Not long ago, the government had something called the food pyramid. And this is what happens when you trust the government to look after you rather than a sane person. 
The government suggested that bread, which many of us now avoid even in small quantities, they said that you needed to have six to 11 servings of bread and starch a day. Of course, the industries associated with that probably gave quite a bit of lobbying money to the Department of Agriculture to make that happen. We don't need the government. We just need people to keep on being, as they have for all of human history, interested in their own well-being. We just need people to stay reasonably selfish and we'll have the demand for that kind of knowledge of what's actually going into food. Chris Marks. GMOs, uh, the government has di dictated that GMOs and food production uh, producers who are acting through the Commerce Clause, the thing that the government has the limited privilege to regulate, doesn't have it doesn't have to honestly disclose. Um, as a libertarian, I would think that informed consent and deriving informed consent would be the utmost importance to us as an entire individual as individuals of this entire society as a nation um i think that as the government we should manu we should mandate that GMO, if there's a GMO pro a product that has GMOs in it, that it has to be labeled, just as we have labeling on our food systems. Because if you believe that companies are going to honestly give you in, in give you all of the information and and gain informed consent from their consumers, you're delusional. I yield my time. All right, let's close it off with Benjamin Letter. Um, you know, from a business standpoint, if, if you want to survive and you want to do well, uh, you know, um, your customers have to trust you. And, you know, advertising the ingredients, if you can advertise the ingredients of your product, uh, and be proud of it, that's probably a good marketing scheme. I mean, just putting the word natural on something uh, has a way of getting people to choose that product versus the one next to it. And, you know, an industry that I came from, the you know, the pet grooming industry, uh, is not a very regulated industry. But, you know, we would buy the, the absolute best shampoos uh, not because the government was telling us to, but because, you know, we know that our customers want the best. And if they found out that we were using some cut rate shampoo with all these horrible ingredients in it, um, they wouldn't be our customers anymore and we would go out of business. And, and that's, that's what happens. All, all government involvement does is, is, is give society this false sense of security to where they don't think that they have to stop doing business because the government's got it all within some, you know, modicum of reasonable control or, or something. Um, and the government has no idea what's going on in the in the hamburger shop down the street or, or you know, the, uh, the food packaging factory. They're not there every day. They, they show up occasionally if they get a call and it creates a false sense of security. What what builds consumer confidence is is having a strong relationship with your consumer, having an open kitchen, uh, sh showing off your 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 facility, showing off the quality of your ingredients. People fall in love with that. Uh, we don't need government okay. inter interference. Um, okay. Okay. And uh, next question: People have looked to the president, and the president directly advises NASA to venture into the stars. Does your administration have any plan for space travel? What is your vision for space exploration during your term? Let's start with Chris Marks. I love sci-fi and I have been a fan of astronomy and science since I was a small, small child. Um, I, I see space exploration as being something that we as a nation should spend, uh, spend some time on 
but I don't think that this is something that the government should be involved with. Space Force One, really? Um, a Master Sergeant Chief from Halo running around as Space Marines until we have proof that there's alien invaders coming here or an impending threat upon our nation from outside our atmosphere, I don't see the point in actually financing a Space Force One. Well, I think that uh, Elon Musk with SpaceX has a great thing and great ambition going on. I'd love to partner with him and find out what he's planning on doing. Um, NASA, questionable ethical behaviors going on there. Um, so I say let the private market actually delve into space exploration. Um, see what they is see what the private market co it comes up with. But should the government be involved with that? No, it doesn't there's no imminent threat upon the nation's sovereignty um, or upon our American way of life. That's a, that's fair. That's fair. Benjamin, let's head up to you. Yeah, space is one of those things that's becoming more and more a part of our lives. And a lot of our communication uh, you know, relies upon it. Uh, a lot of modern technology relies upon it. Uh, other, other countries like to threaten to shoot satellites down. And I guess that's why they want space Marines now is because they think that there's going to be a a battlefield up there at some point and and maybe there is should we start it no absolutely not uh but i suppose that there's a possibility that you know <clears throat> somebody could start some kind of uh war up in space um and in which case either we'll do have to deal without satellites or figure that out um I don't, I don't know how involved the government really needs to be in space. Uh, there was a time where, you know, maybe it wasn't so obvious, but now with Elon Musk and some of the things going on with SpaceX, uh, I see that uh, the, the free market once again is able to do something that, you know, before that happened, we would have thought that surely government is the only one that could pull this off. And I think that uh, the private sector should be uh, taking care of, at bare minimum, the lion's share of this, uh, you know, the costs of the research and development running these space operations, because they're the ones who are financially benefiting uh, from all these communication satellites. It's not like the American people are getting a cut of the check. Um, so why are we footing the bill? All right, Daniel Berman, you're up next. Um, so I agree with a lot of that. There's everyone's making some good points. Um, uh, you know, I think space is awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm a science nerd for, <laughs> um, I, I have been for a lot of my life. I like a lot of sci-fi. Um, but you know, we do have programs like SpaceX that are sending things into space. Um, they're putting, you know, they're, they're going to be putting up satellites and everything else soon. Um, and you know, that's, you know, like it's been said, that's not something the government needs to invest their time and money in. Um, now there's this question of you know is somebody going to start shooting down satellites well that's an interesting question but at the same time someone could go around blowing up cell phone sites cell phone towers um it's not necessarily the responsibility of the government to protect those things if those are privately owned um you know just like banks pay for private security to protect their vaults um that's not something that government does even though government does have a, a bit of involvement in that but it's not necessary um, if you create something and it has a value, you should be the one to protect it. Um, and if we look at things that way, um, the government really doesn't need to get involved with these programs. So I, I think, you know, we can continue to explore space and we can continue to develop science without having to tax and spend. Great. And of course, we'll close it off with Arvind Vora. A few hundred years ago, the Medici sponsored Galileo to do pure scientific research about space, not in space, but about space. And what enabled them to do that is they had individuals with a massive amount of wealth and power. Now today, thanks to automation, thanks to modern technology, individuals produce more. We should be much richer than we were then. Unfortunately, the government takes most of that away and spends it on nonsense. Now, as many of you know, my plan is to end the welfare state and end the income tax. One of the effects of that is going to make the poor richer, but the other effect is going to also make the rich richer. And we're going to see people that have 
a lot of money. Today, people who have a lot of money are already exploring space, Elon Musk and SpaceX. But I imagine that if all of the world's billionaires were suddenly twice as rich, a few more of them might want to leave a legacy beyond simply just being rich while, during their lives. They might want to leave a legacy of scientific research or of space exploration. My, way, my goal is not to have the government have a single monolithic way to explore space, but individuals have many different ways, all kinds of innovations, each, not just countries competing, but I want individuals to be competing to get to Mars first or Jupiter first or wherever. When it comes to protecting private, private property, I do think that is largely the job of the private companies. You know, we buy antivirus software. Banks pay for private security, as Dan pointed out. And yes, Verizon and other companies could very well protect their own satellites. They already protect it with such elaborate encryption, they could also protect it from the unlikely chance that somebody might get a space battleship and try to knock out satellites for whatever reason. Those are private sector innovations, the free market can handle that. And as people get to keep more and more of their money, more people will invest in that kind of pure space research that not just advances science, but captures the imagination. Perfect. All right, let's move on. Let's get into some education issues. Education has always been, according to Real Clear Politics, one of the highest priorities for Americans. In fact, over the last 40 years at the polls, it has never polled less than fourth most important issue. Yet, during the same last 40 years, our country has gone from first to 50th in subjects like reading, writing, math, science, and even fallen behind in simple things like literacy. How does your administration plan to help us catch up? And let's start with Christopher Marks again. Well, I've gotten to spend some time with this uh, gentleman by the name of Arvin. And Arvin is uh, adamant on uh, tearing down the public education system. And I disagree with an over the night turning off the switch on our public education system, dumbing down America even further than it already currently is. Um, however, this has spurred some, inform it spurred some ideas in my head. And one of the things that I'd like to do is I'd like to actually see, instead of financing a public education system, finance maintaining a federal site for all across the United States with some very general, honest educational systems on a daily, on a day-to-day -day routine. So instead of as a nation, us employing hundreds and thousands of public education teachers, we would just finance a single public education teacher for individual sub uh, subjects to sublet a different, a, on a day-to-day -day plan, further empowering the home education system of parents to allow for us to actually get back to the system where we have a single par a single pay or single income household and we can allow at least one of the two parents to stay at home and raise our children, instilling better ethics, better morals, and supervising our child instead of allowing the parent state to supervise our children for us through a public education system. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Letter, you're up next. Um. It's, uh, it's obvious that we've seen uh, uh, American academic performance decline um, over my lifetime, and I believe it was declining before that. Um, you know, earlier we were talking about uh, food labeling and uh, free-range chickens, and, you know, these schools are basically the equivalent of uh, factory farms. I don't know why you'd want to send your children to them. They're really not concerned with the, uh, the educational product that they're they're delivering to the market. They're concerned with behavior and conformity and zero tolerance and selling, uh, you know, behavior modifying pharmaceuticals and any number of things that really don't have anything to do with improving this country in the long term, in my view. Um, now the president is is limited here in what they can do because Texas, for instance, in our state constitution, uh, a public education is guaranteed. So the president of the United States just can't come in into Texas and say, yeah, you guys aren't doing that anymore. 
but we can get the federal government out of the education business. And I have yet to see any proof that there's been any return on investment or any benefit uh, from the federal government being involved in, in such a business. As a matter of fact, I see plenty of evidence otherwise. Um, here locally, I, I get to witness uh, this uh, homeschool group. Uh, they, they call themselves SLY. They, they utilize the, the local city library. They've got parents working together. They, they hire uh, uh, specialized tutors from time to time. They go in on this. They're doing it completely without uh, the federal government's involvement, and they seem to be satisfied with the, the results that they're bringing for themselves. I think people should be free to, to figure this stuff out uh, within their own states and their own communities. All right, right at two minutes, and no, let's... Muted. That's okay, we're right at two minutes anyway. Uh, Arvin, I hear you've got a plan for this. My plan is to abolish the welfare state and end the income tax. And that's gonna do a few things. One is it's going to do, as Christopher suggested earlier, it's going to allow one parent to simply not work. If you don't have all that financial burden, you don't need to work. The Republican Party was the last party to become a successful third party because they were on the right side of just one issue, the issue of slavery. I believe the issue of our time right now is freedom versus statism, and that plays out most poignantly in government schools. I believe we need to get rid of them right now. Now, Christopher wants to have just one uh, rep repository of one great teacher that is there teaching people different subjects. And I don't know why he wants to move us backward because right now we have many repositories, of many great teachers. Folks like Sal Khan from Khan Academy, a uh, great authors have decided, you know, in, in, uh, through programs like Crash Course to put just put stuff out there just to teach people to be better teachers than what people are getting in the four system. And these are people who are doing things for free already. Homeschoolers have already found out, found, found some of these, finding more things. You have MIT's open courseware, you have free courses coming from Harvard and Yale. Why should people be held down to this right now? If we eliminate government schools today, then by tomorrow, people probably freak out a little bit. Day after, they discover what so many homeschoolers have discovered, which is that there are better opportunities, better free and low cost services in the free market. And then on the next day, they would wonder, why did we ever do that stupid thing in the first place? We can abolish government schools immediately. Now, folks have said the president can't do very much about it. Well, that's not actually true. The president can do plenty of things about it. There are both clean and dirty tricks. A simple example, right now, the federal government and federal contractors, because they require degrees, artificially inflate the demand for that, simply getting rid of the, that, that requirement or getting rid of contractors and, and government agencies entirely would set that back. We need to abolish government schools and end the income tax, and that's what I'm going to do. All right, we'll finish with you, uh, Mr. Dan Berman. So public schools, this is, um, this is a pretty big subject, but um, you know, I've, I've made a lot of friends recently in Uganda and Kenya and they've, um, you know, the public school system there is, it is what it is. It's, it's got some ups, it's got some downs just like here. Um, because of that, a lot of people have gotten together and they're creating their own schools and they pretty much fill in the gaps where all of the public schools have, um, huge fault, uh, uh, flaws or, or, um, you know, subjects missing. A lot of them have to do with liberty and freedom because those aren't generally taught in the public schools there. Um, so the, the, the point is that, you know, a lot of people tell me when we say, well, hey, we want to get rid of government schools. They say, well, I don't want to grow up in a world full of idiots. And I don't think any of us does. Um, but the reality is when you start getting rid of these schools, the reason that, that people aren't donating money to create schools in, in all these cities so that people can have an education um, is because the government's already there doing it. Why would you donate money to do something that the government's already doing? You can easily just say, well, I already paid my taxes and the government's doing it. Um, but of course, we're we're getting a crap result from doing that. So we need to, we need to get rid of that and allow um, private organizations and private individuals to start creating these these schools again. Uh, something else that, that um, uh, you know, if you if you look back at the the actual quality, the um, the literacy rate, the quality of education, everything else, it's been declining every time the government comes in and tries to say, hey, we're going to we're going to throw some more money at public education. We're going to create the, the federal department of education. Every single program that they institute, 
people get dumber, their test scores get lower, literacy gets lower. All these problems start happening because they try to create this one size fits all. They try to make the entire country, 320 million people learn the exact same curriculum and it doesn't work. It used to be that we had competitive systems and you could say, hey, this school's better than that one. I want to try to get into that one. We don't have that anymore. Instead, we have a system where teachers are incentivized to get entire classrooms to teach, entire um, ent entire school districts have been encouraged to teach, and we found these we found these programs happening where entire school districts are are encouraging teachers to cheat just so they can get the test scores up and, and get more money from the feds. Great, candidates. Let's move on to the next question. We're gonna stick with schools. Private and charter schools often outperform public schools, but not without controversy. They also often refuse students and are relaxed on expelling students and make the, to, uh, to make their statistics look better. Would you support a tax voucher program so that more students can select these schools in spite of the scandals currently surrounding them? Or would you aim to fix those, fish, uh, those issues before supporting such a program? And we will start with Mr. Daniel Berman. So I, I know Arvin's more of an expert on this. And I, um, you know, I used to have the position that um, that the voucher system was a good thing. And and Arvin kind of straightened me out on that. There are um, a lot more things going on underneath the surface on that that most of us aren't aware about. Um, but, you know, there there is the simple fact that, you know, we're paying for public school. Um, you, no matter where you live, sometimes it's through property tax, sometimes it's through other sales taxes or, or other taxes. Um, we're contributing all this money to these schools. And when we have kids, well, hey, here's a free education because it's our, you know, free because we've already paid for it. Do you want to pay for it again by paying for private school? It doesn't make any sense. We should get that money back if we've already paid in. Um, and we should stop having to pay, pay for it in the future. If you have kids, you should stop paying into that system. You shouldn't need a voucher. You should be able to say, look, this is my money. If I want to spend it on that school, I'll spend it on that school. If I want to spend it on a public school or a private school, I'll spend it where I want to spend it. That should be how this works. And until we, you know, we don't need to give the money to the government and expect them to give it back to us. That's what they do with our income tax. And they give us tax returns and they give us just a little fraction back. Um, that system doesn't work. We need to be in control of our own money. Well, you mentioned him. Let's go ahead and talk to him, Arvin. If you imagine a spectrum, let's say here you have socialism up here and here you have, crony, have capitalism, the question is where do you put crony capitalism? Because it has a word that we like, the capitalism has a word that we're not crazy about. I believe that crony capitalism is taking money by force and spending it on something that you might not want to spend it on. And to me, if this is socialism, then this is also where crony capitalism is. It is in the exact same place. A movement from public schools, which is socialism, to a voucher system, which is crony capitalism, or charter schools, which is a slightly different crony capitalism, is a zero units of movement. And all you've done in that is you've created an entrenched, entrenched crony capitalist class that is going to fight you tooth and nail when you're trying to go to actual capitalism, actual free market schools. Think of it like this. Think about how much teachers complain about a 5% raise or a 5% cut, and they're not making that much money. Now you compare that to what a crony capitalist who's making a few million dollars a year is gonna do, they're gonna fight it a thousand times more. And if you don't believe me, look at how much taxis fought against Uber. Taxis probably agree that it's okay, morally okay to drive people around for money, but no one fought Uber harder than they did. And no one's gonna fight free market educations harder than charter schools and voucher and voucher dependent schools. The way to do this is to do what Dan said, which is to end all forced spending. If you want to, if there, you have a government-run school that you pay to, to go to, that if, that if you want to go to it, you have to pay the tuition. Yeah, fine. I don't care. That doesn't make any difference. But the idea that if you're not using it, you have to pay for it anyway, that is morally wrong and it is educationally ineffective. My plan is to abolish government schools. But my second choice is to simply say, listen, if you want to pay for them, you can pay for them and use them. But if you don't want to pay for government schools, you should not have to pay one cent for them. Changing socialism to crony capitalism is not an answer. The answer is to abolish government schools, abolish the welfare state, and end the income tax. All right, Ben, what do you think? Ben, are you there? muted myself oh you're good go um, ahead you know I, it, it, charter schools I, you know i think arvin just hit the nail on the head it, it's kind of a, a crony capitalism uh solution 
Uh, what we need is to, to get the government out of it. And we also need to get our money out of it. I think, I think Dan was, was kind of dancing around the issue there, you know, and I think, I think we, you know, we've said, some of us have said a few times that, uh, uh, we'd like to see some type of tax credit. Um, if you're, if, you know, if you're not utilizing the, the government schools, then you, you should get some type of tax credit. You know, if you're taking your kid to a, a private school, for instance, or some type of homeschool co-op, um, you're now you're now kind of being double taxed. You're having that you're paying for the private education, you're paying for uh, the the program that you're in, and you're paying for it out of your taxes, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, you know, the, the libertarians often say, uh, and you know, Dan, taxation is that firm is sticks on this line about how we're being uh we're being taxed at the barrel of a gun um i think the libertarians are right about this and i think the government needs to prove that we're wrong by giving us the ability to get our money out of corrupt systems like this and the ability to move that money into more free market solutions which always provide better results Okay, great. And that means we only have uh, Mr. Christopher Marx. Go ahead and finish us off, buddy. Yeah, I'd like to bring a, a, I'd like to bring everybody's attention to the college system. Um, because of federal involvement creating the uh, the Fannie Mae, uh, Sally Mae kind of uh, federal um, college education program, it, it drove up the cost of going to college. Now, because of that, um, we have a lot of people don't, that don't go to college. Uh, the public education system displaced um, your, your engineering, your manufacturing kind of courses, uh, home ec, um, your shop class, stuff like that, and said, we'll just let it go ahead and wait for you to go to pay for college and you'll get those kind of skill sets there. But then you've got these, you've got these exclusive colleges like Harvard, Yale, stuff along those lines. Those are for those big money spenders, those people that have a lot of money to dump into an education system. This is a metaphor for what happens in this, in this idealistic situation where we shut down the public education system. If you shut down the public education system, there are going to be people all across this nation that go without a basic education. We don't want that. That is not the way to actually get P get uh, companies to come into this nation and employ our people because they'd be illiterate and incompetent. We need to maintain at least the basic standard. Now, I'm not talking about, hey, we're going to hire Bob and Bob's going to teach economics, Bob's going to teach history, Bob's going to teach mathematics, Bob's going to teach spelling and English. No. What I'm saying is that as a nation, we can, we can make this more efficient. And I'm not even saying that we have to employ Bob, Sue, and so on and so forth to actually create this website, we can seek out some of our nation's most intelligent people. Because as somebody that I kind of touts themselves as an educator myself in my own field, um, I think that we can volunteer to do this and maintain our nation's intelligence. Thank you. Great. We have two more questions then, candidates. We've got some great uh, feedback from the audience, and, and we'll turn it into an open forum here. One idea that has grown popularity in America is a plan to have free college. Inner city students and impoverished families would greatly benefit from this, even if it is at the expense of wealthier families. With the disparity in educational standards rapidly growing between the rich and the poor, how would you plan to attack this college problem? And we're going to start with uh, Benjamin Letter. Ben, I think you're still on mute, my friend. Have we lost him? Yeah, it looks like his system cut, system cut out. Gotcha. Well, uh, in that case, Arvin, you are next. OK, awesome. Today, government subsidies have driven up the price of college. The college used to be relatively affordable. But through their subsidies, they've made college increase in price at three times the rate of, in, of inflation. That's not good for anyone. It's, it's bad for the rich and it's 
exponentially worse for the poor. The solution to that is not to double down on it. This myth is that if the government pays for something, it becomes free or cheap or efficient, or you don't have to pay that much for it. If that's true, then why is, has, does the military cost us so much? I mean, that's what free looks like. Yeah, I get that college right now is bad, but making it as, as expensive and damaging and pointless as the military, that's not the solution by any stretch of the imagination. Instead, here's what we need to do. End all federal subsidies of any kind, all student aid, aid Pell Grants, whatever, and this is going to give colleges a choice. Either they can find a way to lower tuitions or they can go out of business. And I guarantee you there's going to be some college that will choose either option. Now, people have, have pointed out, Christopher pointed out that currently the Ivy League has become a bastion for the rich. And he's right because they're selling just one thing, exclusivity. They're not selling quality. If they're selling quality, then Harvard would have across the country 50,000 branches all doing their supposed high quality education. That's not what they're selling. They're just selling exclusivity. Uh, other countries, for example, India, IIT, the Indian Institute of Technology, which has a lot of respect, has many branches. It's not unusual for colleges to have multiple branches if you actually have a service that matters. But if all you're selling is smoke and mirrors that's subsidized by the government, then yeah, you just want to keep on being exclusive. What we need to do is get the government entirely out of it. Let innovators innovate. Let government stop favoring employment for, for people who have college degrees. Let people find better ways to provide education or to just educate themselves. My plan is to end all financial aid to colleges, force them to drive down their prices or go out of business, and that their choice is going to be theirs. All right. And that leaves us. Let's lead us to uh, Christopher Marks. You're up next. Absolutely, Arvin. Uh, thank you for picking up on that. Yes, we need to eliminate federal involvement in subsidizing college education because through those federally subsidized um, loans to people to go to school, it has created this uh, this college a uh, college access um, that has driven up the cost. If we stop that, if we went back to it, there was a time period in the 1950s, I believe it was, where you could go to college for about, I think it was $54 a day. And that was living in the dorms. Um, we can go back to those times. We can free our minds and free our education, but not in that free sense where we're taking from somebody else and giving it to you. No, we're talking about actually allowing the free market to compete. And yes, colleges will go under or colleges were so it will survive, but the education and the American spirit of innovation will thrive on. Benjamin, I think we lost you for a second. We're talking about uh, free college. Do you want to give your two cents on this? Yeah. Yeah. Electricity went out for just a second. Um, free college. 2020 convention theme, guys. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Um, somebody explain to me how this free is actually free. We all know that somebody is paying for it. Um, you know, I, I missed the question. So if we're talking about free college, pretty simply, I'm, I'm against that. There ain't no such thing. Thing is free lunch. We all know that that free is 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 a lie, um, and that it comes if it's going it's going to come at a price. Uh, if we want to fix uh, the college uh, you know system and get back to I, what I heard Chris talking about as some of the the older prices, we need to get rid of all this uh, this lending market because what the lending market the the student loan market has done is they have put all this cheap easy access money out there and the uh, the colleges they know they know the money's out there so they know they know that they can they can elevate their prices uh and the the loan companies they're they want to make money too it's just like the mortgage environment you know mortgage companies don't want to write loans that are less than 50 really 100 grand they don't want to that's small business to them they want the bigger loans um so everybody involved has an incentive to to drive the price up, uh, you know that's 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 why, you know, the, the real estate market is is as expensive as it is. It's hard. It's hard. The national uh, average home price is, is well over a hundred thousand. That's because that's where the lending market likes to be. Because we've got the lending market up in the education 
market. Uh, we've inflated the price because all of those parties have an incentive to inflate the price so they can sell larger amounts of debt and collect more interest. So get them out of it and okay. you'll, you'll see your prices come back down. Okay, Daniel, taxation is theft. Berman, you get to close this, this question out. So uh, first I wanna say that the concept of free college is actually awesome. Uh, which is not something you want to hear a libertarian say. But we have to understand what the word free means. The word free does not describe a zero cost of acquisition. Um, free means to be liberated, to be to be free. It's freedom. Um, and so when a college, you know, colleges are there for, for two reasons. Um, people go there to learn a skill so that they can, they're investing in their future so that they can go and get a job that's going to be high paying, more high paying than others. And the other reason is they go there to work with people. They work to work. Uh, they, they go there to work with people in groups on innovative projects that they might not be able to do other places because colleges have access to um, facilities with equipment that, you know, you can't just get unless you already have those skills and you go apply for a job. And of course, then you're working for a corporation who now owns that discovery. Um, so, you know, when we consider that there, there are two different reasons to go to college, you know, just like everybody said, all these loans are there to, you know, most people go there thinking, hey, they're going to get a job out of it. Um, and then they go and they take a class on something that there's no job in. And then you have banks that are that are subsidizing these loans. Well, what's the easiest way you could because can banks actually give loans? Sure, that's that's a free market. They should be able to, except for the whole fact that fractional reserve lending is is a fraud. Um, but, uh, you know, but they should be able to lend money if they do so um, ethically. And how do you stop them from lending money to students who are going to school for something that's not going to earn them a return on their investment and they're not going to be able to pay back the loan? You take away uh, the, the government's protection of these loans, saying that these people are going to be followed by this debt until they die. It should be like any other debt. If, if a credit card company lends to somebody with bad credit, they know that there's an assumed risk that this person might not be able to pay back their credit card loan. The same thing should be true when when a when a bank lends money to a student, the government should have no involvement in that. If the student is in, is investing in in I think someone mentioned basket weaving as their as their major, um, the bank should know they're probably not going to be able to pay back a $500,000 loan on that. Student loans are often federally dispersed and regulated. You as the president will be able to control this debt, which in many occupational standards is the most substantial debt people will ever occur. What is your plan with student loans that already exist and what will you do with future loans? Well, I think that what I'd first, uh, I'd first start doing is, well, the, number one, this would actually require Senate approval because it is a, of a financial matter. Um, we would need to, uh, I'd say that we need to get rid of the, the interest rate as well as displacing the third party administrators over those debt collections. Um, I think that I may, as an individual that has a, as, has a school loan, um, I'm tired of trying to track down who actually has my school loan. And when I start making payments to one party, having to track it down to another one need to get rid of the interest rate. We need to allow it to where the individuals that actually have received these loans pay it off dollar for dollar, no interest back to the federal government so that we can actually see the, uh, see the government become fiscally solvent in that regard. We need to also see the federal government get out of financing school loans altogether. That is what drove up the cost of, public, uh, of the college education system. So once we get rid of these problems, I think that we'll have the situation under control again. Um, and then, you know, I, yes, you won't be going to school to go for basket weaving because, you know, you won't be able to actually pay off your student loan um, or actually finance your livelihood weaving baskets for a living. Great. And let's move on to Daniel Berman. Yeah. So I, I think the, government needs to completely get out of that business. Um, that's what banks are for. Um, you know, we don't see government competing in the electronics industry. We don't see government competing in pretty much any other industry. Um, just, you know, prisons and police and, and courts, <laughs> those sort of things. Um, the, the government does not need to be giving out loans to people. Um, this is, you know, and it doesn't need to be insuring bank loans. These are the these are the reasons that the prices on college are so high to begin with. If we get rid of these programs, the prices are going to start falling. And just as everybody pointed out, you'll be able to 
work a summer job and pay for college. Um, you know, there are there are community colleges that are already a lot less expensive than some of the big universities, um, and you don't need loans to get into them. This is just how things work. And and the bigger colleges, they want the smartest people there. That's that's how they get their their prestige by saying, hey, we have the smartest people. We come up with the biggest innovations, all that stuff. They're looking at your SAT scores. They're looking at, you know, whatever criteria they have to admit the smartest students in. And if, if the smartest student says, hey, I have no money, they don't care. They want that student in there. But if the smartest student says, well, I have no money, but the bank just offered to give me a half a million bucks. Well, why don't you go to the bank and get that half a million bucks and we'll let you in? That's that's how it works. So, um, you know, if we get the if we get the government and we get the banks out of this industry, the prices are going to fall. Colleges are going to be great. Um, and, you know, it, and another another interesting point is we don't really need college anymore because so much of this information is available online. So, you know, there it's it's very specialized. Not everybody needs what the actual college provides. It's not a place that you go to to incur debt and walk away with the diploma that's going to give you a high paying job. That's not what college is. That's never what it was supposed to be. That was a sales pitch to increase the sales of, of all these lending programs just to make a profit. All right, Arvind Vora, your turn. The, the first thing to do is to, to stop the bleeding. And the way to do that is to end all federal subsidies to college. If I'm president, I'm going to end every single federal subsidy ranging from Pell Grants to federally backed loans. And Dan's right. Banks should be the one ones making those decisions. If you want to get a loan from a bank for a small business, you have to show the bank that your small business is in some way likely to actually pay off. The same thing should be true for any kind of education, not just college education, it could be trade school education, it could be experimental education, whatever. If you want to be able to get a loan for it, then you should be able to show the bank and the bank should voluntarily agree to, to fund that. The way to to make college price go down is to make that happen because quite frankly banks are not going to fund you know two three hundred thousand dollars for a degree in which either there are not very many jobs or just as commonly there are simply no jobs on earth guarantees out now when it comes to people who already have loans the only change i would make is remove the federal backing in other words have the same bankruptcy protections apply to outstanding college loans as X apply to any other type of loan. This is going to hurt banks a lot. And I guarantee you this, you're gonna see a lot of too big to fail banks fail. And when that happens, if I'm president, they're not gonna get a bailout, they're gonna get laughed at by me. And then the other banks that were smart enough to, to not get involved with the government will be the next big banks. If I'm president, A, Banks are probably going to, the, the big, big established banks are probably going to fail and B, the startup, intelligent, useful banks are going to be the new ones. That's the kind of innovation we need to see in the financial sector. So in terms of shutting down the future loan, get government out of it, force price colleges to lower prices or go out of business. And for the current ones, remove bankruptcy protections. All right. And that gives you the final word on this one, Mr. Benjamin Letter. Um, well, you know, I touched on this in, in my last answer, and I feel like you know, everyone else here has, has, has pretty much, you know, said essentially the same is the, this lending industry, they're, they're not selling you a quality education, they're selling you a loan. And I think it's hard for a lot of people to, to wrap their minds around this is a product, this is, this is a product that is sold, the loan is the product. You know, you, you think that you're buying the education, you know, just like when you go to the car lot, you think that you're, you're buying the car. But, you know, another thing that you're buying is the money in the form of, of a loan. And I suspect that we, we may be on the verge of creating some type of, you know, I don't know what to call it, education bubble. I, I think that, you know, some of the other candidates were kind of hinting at, you know, uh, the too big to fail thing. You know, what happens when, when the government insures uh, a financial market uh, that is, is obviously uh, uh, inflating the costs of, of education. Um, it looks like a bubble to me. And, and what's going to be the fallout of that bubble? Um, you know, are colleges going to go out of business? Maybe. Um, you know, people will fall victim to their to their own mistakes and, and bad business practices. And the the, the, the institutions that 
are forward thinking enough to, to see these problems now and to get out of that type of business model and to start to adjust their business model uh, away from one that's based upon uh, a federally insured uh, lending market, uh, they're going to be the ones to survive. Just like uh, during uh, the financial crisis, Ford didn't accept any bailout money. They had some rough years there, but they survived without the bailout money. They didn't have to file bankruptcy. They didn't have to perform. Um, those are going to be the companies uh, or the educational institutions that survive. The ones that see this for what it is and start moving away from it now. All right, guys, great. Uh, so we've got about 10 minutes here to just shoot the breeze. We're going uh, to start with the questions that got asked from the live chat. Now, we actually really only had one that I can tell that relates directly to this particular debate. And so we're going to start with that one before we get into some other things. But again, this is open forum. I'm not going to time you. Just chime in, uh, casually talk here. What are your stances on fourth generation nuclear energy to combat coal and natural gas pollution? I'm actually not a fan of nuclear energy. I think that nuclear energy produces too much waste. However, I have been recently reading up on some low, um, a, some uh, low heat, um, high yield energy, nuclear energy production methods that the nuclear waste that is that results from that has a significantly lower half life than um, our current conventional nuclear um, power production uh, means. Uh, so that's something to that is of interest to me. However, anything that is actually producing nuclear waste with, I would say, lasting over a 10 year yield uh, is dangerous for our environment, for our climate, for our mother earth. I think one of the big issues you have with nuclear is that right now it's actually getting a very large government subsidy. Because often government handles the waste, which is one of the most expensive parts of the whole process. If you if you got rid of that subsidy, you're going to see more innovations like what Christopher's talking about, where people find ways to make the waste less expensive. Uh, and I really think that even with nuclear, the situation is to get the government subsidies out of it. And if it turns out that even with the safety issues, even with any risks, even with the disposal of radioactive waste, nuclear is still cheaper, which, by the way, I kind of doubt. But if it still is, then it's the winner. And people can find ways to make it even better to lower their costs rather than having the government give this, this subsidy of dealing with the trash. Yeah, I think that the um, uh, what Chris was talking about was probably thorium, which is... Um, it's it's a, basically a different element uh, that's used in in the production of of nuclear energy so um so yeah the uranium that's that's previously used creates a lot of nuclear waste that's all purchased by the government because they like to use it to create nuclear weapons um and you know if you get the government out of the military and, and out of buying all that waste then you know you solve a lot of problems at the same time you you have less nuclear weapons um <laughs> you have less nuclear waste and and thorium actually is really amazing in the way that it works and and oh, there's this big misconception that you see these like big steam towers with like all this white smoke coming out of it and that's all radioactive waste going being spewed up into the sky a lot of people kind of think that um the reality is this is just steam the way that nuclear energy works is it creates heat um which creates steam and powers a turbine now in in places like california where you have a a, a shortage of water but you have a huge amount of water right there in the ocean um, you you know you you create a nuclear power plant with something like thorium. What you're actually doing is uh, is you're actually creating clean water at the same time you're 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 creating energy. And when you use something like thorium instead of uranium, you you come up with a with a product that's a lot less dangerous. And also the process on that element is is a lot less dangerous in general. So you don't have the the high risk of nuclear meltdowns and all these other things. So it's it's really an awesome source of energy. Um, it's less expensive. It's less dangerous. There's so many, so many benefits to switch to it. But of course, the government can't subsidize that one because they can't buy weapons grade plutonium from it. Um, so, you know, that's another problem where you get government out of it and it kind of solves itself. 
You know, when Dan, when you were just talking about how in California um, they had this a large mass of water, um, in regard to renewable resource electricity, there are these things called wave ge uh, wave generators, and effectively what it is is it's a long line of buoys that are um, that are kind of chained together, and the wave movement of up and down itself generates electricity. <laughs> yeah, there's there's like a million, you know, I've seen so many different innovations like that and they're great. Um, the reality is things like that, even like wind and solar power, they're, you know, they're great. They do create a lot of energy, but for a massive scale, like to power an entire city, um, it's really not effective. But now if everybody starts putting their own solar or if you live next to a lake and you want to put like a, a water wheel or you live near the ocean and you want to build your own like those are those are really great systems for all kinds of different reasons um so i think the reality is you need to have a free market system if none of these things are being subsidized then anybody wherever you live the best solution for you might be something completely different it might be solar it might be nuclear it might be waves um it, it can be anything we need people to be able to decide for themselves and the, the best part about that is if people are generating their own electricity they're not worried, like what happens when the power grid goes out? Nobody cares because a lot of people have their own, they have backups. Maybe they're connected to a grid that they use most of the time to share energy. Um, there's just so many different ways it can work out to everybody's benefit. Yeah, you, you've inspired me with, with, the, with the fact that you're, you know, you're living in Mexico a lot of the time. And, and so I've been looking at different places in different countries to not have to deal with you regulations and, and all that. And it is interesting, you see what you're saying, which is that so many places will advertise that we're using this type of solar or this type of wind. So even though it's not hooked up to a reliable US-based electrical grid, they have this other thing that's even more reliable. And I think it's fascinating stuff out there. Great, um, so let's, uh, let's, move, let, let's keep shooting the breeze here. We still got a few minutes. Um, so my buddy, Nick Irwin over at the Enemy of the State uh, podcast, I know all of you guys probably know him and either love him or hate him. Uh, he, he, he always manages to rub you, and sometimes it's the right way or the wrong way, but Nick is my buddy, and he asks questions, so uh, we're going to address at least some of them here. Do you see the Libertarian Party, this is, this is separate from the subject, but do you see the Libertarian Party for electing politicians or a platform for getting the message of anarchy out there? And I'm going to combine that with this question. Is freedom granted by politicians perpetuating the myth of authority that freedom has to be granted by politicians and isn't something you inherently have? However, whoever wants to tackle that one. I wouldn't mind taking a stab at it. I mean, as, as an ANCAP myself, that, that's a question. It's a question that I've wrestled with. Like, so first, does freedom come from politicians? No, but it can certainly be taken away from them. Uh, when the, the, one of the reasons that at least that I chose to run for office rather than, than, than refuse to run for office on account that the whole system is corrupt is I view the political system as the enemy. And I view this, my campaign as essentially a hostile invasion. Uh, as a martial artist, I believe in using the enemy's force against them. You're not gonna be bigger and stronger than everybody you face. And sometimes if you can find a way to use the enemy's force against the enemy, that's great. And that's what we can do here. I mean, we can, you know, get out ideas of Bitcoin, jury nullification, abolishing government schools, homeschooling, because of the circus that this election is going to be or that it already is. And, and trust, I mean, if, if I'm the nominee or honestly, if I'm not the nominee, I'm going to do my best to use as much of that free media to get anti-state ideas out there. So I really do think that participating in this to get the message out is such a fundamental, it's, it's a huge advantage for us. And, and as long as you're not saying that, yeah, I love the state and I, I love and all that kind of stuff to do it, I think it's totally fine to, to use any of this power against it. I, I'd like to actually address that. I am not an anarchist. I am what I would consider to be a transitional, um, a, a transitional candidate. You identify I, as trans, Chris? Huh? I'm just I'm just pulling your oh. leg, buddy. Go ahead. Uh, I see myself as a transitional candidate, somebody that's going uh, that sees where the libertarian uh, uh, the libertarian um, political platform has ideally uh, it, it sees what we should be as a nation, and I also see the corruption, the degradation of American traditional values. Um, through our current two-party system, and I would like to transition the misinformed Republicans and Democrats into libertarianism to under to restore this republic to a true 
traditional Republican value, one where you are of self-governing, where one of self-governing principles, where you have individual rights and individual freedoms, rather than this democracy that we uh, that we allegedly live in. When we see it, when we come together as a party and understand that Democrats pushing up on state authority and the overall state demand for your tax dollars stealing from you at, through taxation and then you see the democrat or the republicans with their agenda to push down on the overall tax contribution of those who are legitimately involved in the commerce clause leaving the overwhelming burden of the tax burden upon the individual sovereign people of this nation the it 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 rips from the republic traditional republican values and it degrades our individual rights and our individual freedoms and i want uh, i want that transition to occur but can we do that overnight i don't believe so yeah i'll uh you know i agree that's not happy i can (laughs) (laughs) there's there's you know there's something to be said about a transition um you know, we do want to get rid of, at, at the very least, all of the, uh, you know, nap type violations of, of government. Um, but, you know, what's I, you know, I always say the government should be so small that you don't even know that it exists. Um, you know, and but at the same time, people have the right to freely associate. So something, um, you know, something, let's say you get you snap your fingers and completely get rid of government. A lot of people are still going to come along and say, well, since government's not here, we should create this new organization and, and people are going to create things. And I've, I've lived in places where, you know, you have um, you have a new organization that's uh, like, let's say, let's say a, a bunch of houses together and there's no HOA. But there are these people that are, you know, maybe it's maybe it's within the same building. Um, and these people are like they, they have to create an HOA. That's part of the agreement from the original purchase. But there are no rules. And this is literally anarchy. And the the I, I've been through this and I've seen the things that people come up with. And sometimes it's as much as like when your dog shits on the lawn, you have to pick up after it. And some people are like, well, that doesn't bother me if there's shit all over the lawn. So I shouldn't have to clean up after my dog. The, the non-aggression principle says, you know, oh, well, as long as you're not harming another person, then you're free to do whatever you want. Well, you're not really harming another person by leaving that there on the lawn, but everybody kind of wants it cleaned up. It hurts the property value and all these other things. So you, you come into like um, an understanding of like, OK, well, if anarchy, as a lot of people say, is it's it doesn't mean a system without rules. It means a system without rulers. OK, that's fine. But what happens when you come up with some rules and most people agree with them and then one person says, OK, but I don't agree with that rule and I don't want to live according to that. How do you enforce that now? Or do you just say, OK, all the rules are out the window? So it's it's an interesting philosophical um, exercise to have. But the reality is, you know, when we look at what government does, um, you know, governments living a thousand miles, you know, centralized a thousand miles away from where you are should not be able to dictate, um, you know, whether or not you could do drugs, whether or not, you know, you can paint your house a certain color or something else. Everything should be as local as possible because those are the people that you're interacting with the most. Ben, I do want to give you a chance at this question. Go ahead, buddy. It's all right. You're good? Okay. Uh, Is it my turn? Well, it my it, it's open forum. So I just figured since everybody else went, I okay. mean, if you yeah, want yeah, to. I know, I know, I know. Okay. It was my idea to do it open forum. I'm <laughs> having right. a good time listening to everybody. <laughs> yeah. So I gave Nick this nickname, uh, non-voting Nick. That's 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 what he's known as now. Um, and, and he seems to believe that, that his strategy of not voting uh, affects change better than our strategy of running for an office that um, we're going to have a hard time winning in the general election. It's going to be tough. Um, I'm not going to say we don't have a chance, but uh, it's, 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 it's really uphill. So, you know, somebody was trying to throw some, you know, accusations my way the other day. And I said, you know, you must think I'm pretty electable if you think I'm doing this for power. I mean, come on. You know, I, I don't think any of us up here are do, doing this because we have aspirations of, of power. If, if we if we we'd be doing something else, um, it, it's not necessarily our job. Like Chris, he's he's not an anarchist. Uh, you know, as he just made it clear, it's not necessarily all of our job to 
pick up every pet issue of every fringe group of, of the Libertarian Party. And I know that the, that the anarchist wing really likes to project that and, 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 and demand that the, the LP is anarchy. And it's not the anarch. We're not the anarchist party. We have anarchists in our party. We're we're compatible with anarchists, but we're not the anarchist party. So Chris doesn't have to carry an anarchist message if he doesn't want to, and he shouldn't be expected to because there's other members of the party that you know kind of lean his way. And if he's representing uh, you know ideas that they appreciate, then why not have him up here? Why, why is it a problem if, if he says something that could be construed as a, a little status from time to time? Our job is to come up with ideas and to, to inspire uh, you guys to, to come up with ideas and to act upon them. Uh, and if we can work together here uh, to come up with ideas, act upon them and inspire others to do this, to, do, to essentially do the same, I think that we all accomplished a good portion of what we came here to do yeah let's yeah. uh can i say one last thing go ahead in regard to this one of my favorite messages that i constantly see coming out of the libertarian party is we run for office to take over the government to leave you alone that's what i think what i personally in my heart feel the libertarian party's message is and the libertarian party's agenda is yeah all right uh i will let uh i'll let the commenters hash that all out but let's go back to science energy and education candidates i gave you the chance to uh prepare some statements and so let's go with those uh and we will start with mr daniel berman so uh i don't like prepared statements um we'll wing it so, for three minutes dan yeah so I'll, I'll just say you know on energy um energy is energy is awesome um, if it weren't for energy, we wouldn't be having this conversation right here through the miracle of the internet, which, uh, I, I think over the last hour, I learned that my internet down here in Mexico is more stable than all, all of you guys up in the U S. Um, <laughs> that is, that is hurtful. <laughs> Sorry guys. Uh, just, just dropping facts. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, you know, energy is what's really interesting about energy so i travel a lot and i have this video production studio that i do and one thing that that i do with this um you know whether i'm podcasting whether i'm doing video is i like to use as little energy as possible because either that means i get to use batteries and i don't have to be constantly looking for outlets and pulling wires across the room to make everything work um and if I'm using batteries, that means I can use fewer batteries or less batteries, which means when I get on the plane, I don't have to pay because my bags are over 50 pounds. Um, there is an incentive to use less energy. And this incentive is there for everybody. There's there's incentives for uh, manufacturing facilities. There are incentives for you know everything. Once you look at the cost of things and you say, oh, this is actually expensive. We're using a lot of electricity. Let's use less. Um, there are incentives to do away with that. Um, you know, and, and going back to before we had electricity or even now with electricity, there have been ways that people have created to to not use electricity, but to use use non electrical energy um, for things like um, if you're next to a river, you can create a, a water wheel that's pushed by the river. And instead of turning a generator, which creates electricity, that would actually turn something and, and that could be a mill or, you know, it could be anything um, that's energy. Um, you know, typically when we think about energy, it's just electricity coming out of the wall, but energy comes in so many forms. And the, the reality is energy is a scarce resource and we have a natural inclination to use as little of it as possible because the, the, the less we use, the more we're able to do with it. Um, and, you know, when you get government involved in things, what that does is, you know, we, we always ask like, well, why is, why aren't we switching to solar if, if oil is everywhere? I mean, sorry, if oil is so bad for the environment. Well, government's subsidizing oil. They're making it cheaper. Um, they're making it less expensive than switching to solar. So it's, you know, government is in there. They're, they're always trying to fix things, but they're always making things more difficult. And the reality is we just need to get government out of it. And we need to let the markets create the opportunity for us to, to use electricity more efficiently um, and to create better ways of, of creating that energy or harvesting that energy from all sorts of natural resources. So I, I think that's, 
and you know. if that's your three minutes for not preparing it, that's pretty good. All right, uh, Christopher Marks, let's have your closing statement. You know, I'd like to actually start out with the education. Like I said, I am a transitional, what I consider to be a transitional candidate, and I see the value in education as somebody that considers myself to be that of an educator. Um, I think that we need to maintain a basic standard of education within this nation. Uh, I think the degradation of the education in this system has been because we've allowed government to run the public education system into the ground and literally uh, impoverish many educators all across the nation. Energy. If we got rid of the bailouts, we got rid of all of the subsidies in regard to our current uh, current energy suppliers. I think that we would see them being more and being more innovative and seeking out maybe cl seeking out cleaner um, energy produ energy production things. And I, like I said, I would love to see our government sustain sustaining itself as well as keeping itself busy. By making an honest day's making an honest day's work out of generating renewable resource electricity and financing themselves that way instead of actually taking from the people, um, and that's the that's that's it. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, let's move on to Benjamin Letter. You no, know, for some reason I'm just sitting here thinking about the B fifty two bomb. Berman, you fly a lot. Would you would you get on a damn near 70 year old commercial plane? This is what happens when you let the government run stuff. You got 70 year old planes still still in operation. Um, we need to get the government out, out of pretty much all of these things. Education would improve. Get the government out of out of energy on on all levels. Uh, and even the, the small little homeowners associations that are against uh, you know, wind and solar, even though wind and solar has never replaced a, a nuclear or a, a coal plant. Um, the big, my, my, my big solution, which may not be the most genius thing ever said, is just to get the government out of it because they've proven to be incompetent and in, in areas where we see uh, the private sector, uh, where they have no choice but to be competent or fail, they they choose to be competent, whereas government, they don't have that same pressure. So they have the luxury of being incompetent. Um, I guess these are our closing remarks. So uh, uh, benletter.com, if you want to find out more. Another thing that I wanted to mention is, uh, you know, some some people in there's been a lot of, uh, you know, talk about the, the primaries, the actual primaries. And for, for 2,500 bucks, a pop guys uh we can all run against each other in the oklahoma primaries um there's some other primaries as well but uh the folks out of oklahoma were the ones that were really adamant about uh wanting to see us do this so i i spoke i mentioned this to berman uh i don't know about the rest of you guys you know but we need to raise 2500 bucks a piece to run against each other in the primaries in oklahoma uh there's a few other states as well um i've i've started a uh a, a, like a special fundraiser on my uh, website specifically for this uh, i recommend you guys do the same i'd like to i'd like to run against you guys in the primary who accepts the challenge i don't know get with me after the debate guys all right and that leaves our closing closing statement that'll be arvin vora one of the most incredible experiences of my life has been the opportunity to attend homeschooling and private education conventions. And here's what you see. You see a free marketplace, not just in an abstract form, but in a real visible form. You see par parents who get to choose between so many different providers, providers of educational math games, educational curricula, instead of having to be stuck with one curriculum, they can choose from a variety of different things. For teachers and educators, it's even more exciting because they get to be the ones who make those games, who work on that kind of education. Now, I happen to be one of the people who has this incredible privilege of being able to work in the free market of education. It's amazing. It's constantly innovative. Every day we're trying out new things. It's so exciting. And here's the thing. 
I know that if all the millions of people dedicated to education in the world, not just the millions and millions of homeschoolers, not just the millions and millions of private schoolers, but the millions and millions of teachers who want to teach, they're not there because them. But the fact is they could be adding to all this kind of innovation. They could be trying out new great ideas instead of being forced to try out somebody else's stupid idea, things like Common Core. That would be great, not just for, edu for, for parents, but it would be great for educators. It would create a, a sector, an economic boom on par with the tech sector. The only thing I believe that's even close to as important as education is technology, and look at where the free market has gotten us there. We have free things, we have competition for free things. We have different websites saying, no, 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 we'll search the entire internet for you for free. Imagine if we had that level of competition in education. Now online, we already have it. We already have Khan Academy competing with Coursera, competing with edX, competing with MIT's open courseware. You already have that online, but we can have that in person. Economic growth that we've seen, that we've seen at the fast in the technology sector, why? It's squandered on the backwards and ineffective government model. We could do what America does best, which is innovate. Now, I know some people will tell you, well, Europe has, has, uh, has public schools. Yeah, that's one of the many reasons not to do it. The founders of this country left Europe's backwards, hidebound ways because they wanted to be free, because they wanted to innovate. And look what that innovation has brought us. It's brought us every major advancement from the microchip to the car. Those have all all happened in the United States. If we let that kind of innovation drive our education, we could have something beyond what any of us could begin to imagine. I don't just mean education, all the great teachers and all the great parents can finally buy and create and sell all the great innovations that are going to make America the most educated country on earth. My website is votebora.com. Right at three minutes. Very well rehearsed, my friend. Guys, thank you all so much for joining us. I appreciate your time. Uh, be back in two weeks. Uh, we always try to get usually William Hurst and Kimberly Ruff come to these things. They just couldn't quite make it into this debate. But it'll be uh, our first of two economic debates. Uh, economy is a huge passion of mine, obviously. So uh, please tune in. Share this with your friends. Let them know. Tell them about the candidates. Support us on Patreon. And if you have any questions for the candidates themselves, they'd give me their information. Feel free to reach out to them. We're doing this for their exposure as well as ours, and we just love to uh, get you the information so that you can make an informed decision on who the best candidates are. Again, thank you so much for your time joining us this week, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Hey, Hardy.